2024. What's this year going to be like? Do you know? I don't know. I've thought about that sometimes. I've thought, do I want to know what's going to happen in the year ahead of me? And I've kind of come to the conclusion, I'm probably glad I don't know. Because it's always something, isn't it? We, we, I mean, you know, we have the New Year's resolutions, we have these dreams, we plans, we have these, you know, someone asked me the other day, well, have you planned out your 2024 yet? And I'm thinking, I haven't got to Sunday yet. <laughs> so I, no, no, 2024 is not planned out. And that's okay. Because we don't know what's going to happen. And it does bring with it a certain amount of trepidation, doesn't it? Because we don't have to look that far back in our calendar to have found some years that were a little less than good. And we all know intuitively that there are going to be struggles this next year because every year has struggles, right? There will be losses this next year because every year has losses. That's a part of it. But there's also will be joys and triumphs. There will be good things and struggles and bad things. There will be ups and there will be downs. We will all at some point walk on a mountaintop and most of us will probably at some point walk in a valley because that's the way life is. But it is a great adventure. It is a great journey. And while we don't know exactly where it will always take us, what do we know? We know the one who walks with us. And that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want, because he leads me beside green pastures, he leads me beside the still waters, he restoreth my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I dwell in his presence today on this side. And one day I will dwell with him on the other side. So as we come to communion today, as we begin our year, I think it's appropriate that we begin it at the table. Every really good journey ought to start with a big meal anyway. That's just the way that ought to happen. And good books, they always have a good meal before they start off on their journey. And I think as we begin 2024, God invites us to come to his table for a couple reasons. One, that we might be fed by his word. That we might know that the nourishment for our souls is not just in bread and drink, but it's in every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. He invites us to the table so that we might remember that he has already made a way through our biggest fears of sin and death and fear. And that he has overcome them through his death and resurrection. He invites us to come to the table to know that we are welcome into his presence whenever we need to come. And he welcomes us to the table to know that we do not go alone. Not only does he go with us, but he has provided us with a church family that goes with us as well. For not only do I know that as I walk into the next year, no matter what comes, not only do I have God with me, but he gave me a church family as well. A church family that will wrap its arms around me and walk with me. They'll laugh with me and cry with me. They'll pick me up when I cannot go any further. They will allow me to carry them when they are weak. They will share with me all of life because we do life together. And at the table, I am reminded not only of the gift of God and his son, Jesus Christ, but I'm reminded of my church family that gathers with me for that meal. And so this morning, as we come to the table to begin our journey into 2024, as we begin to launch ourselves out into whatever it is he has for us individually and corporately and as families and as a community, that we are prepared to go because we go with him and we know that he goes with us when we follow him. So this morning as you 
come to the table in a few minutes. The ushers will dismiss you. If you want the prepackaged communion, it is they will have some copies, but otherwise when you come forward, uh, as they dismiss you, uh, our deacons Bob and Lynn will be down here to serve you. You can find a place here at the front row, and the seats are here, one and a half, you get one and a half. You can sit over here or you can kneel over here, or you can stand if you just want to come forward and stand. And sometimes our knees don't give us kneeling privileges anymore. If you need elements brought to you, they will be glad to bring them to you. But as we partake in the simple thing of taking the cup and the bread in our hands, may we be reminded of all that God has done for us that brought us here. And may we be reminded that he goes with us. And may we be grateful for what he's done. And may we anticipate with joyfulness what he is yet to do. Join me in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that we might come into your house to start this year, that we might celebrate and worship your Son, Jesus Christ, that we might be reminded that your light shines in this darkness, and this darkness cannot overcome it. And in the same way, there is nothing that you do not overcome. There is nothing that you cannot lead us through. There is nothing that you cannot bring victory and goodness to, even when it's something that was intended for evil. For you are a good God. And we have seen your goodness, and we know that you will continue to pour that out upon us. So Lord, we thank you for this day of worship. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, and your grace, and your mercy, and your love that has transformed us. And we thank you that we do not walk into this next year alone, but that you go with us. So help us to follow. Help us to follow you individually and as families and couples. Help us to follow you as a church. Help us to be a community and help us to become a nation that follows you. So Lord, we dedicate ourselves to you afresh this year as we come and partake upon the, in these elements. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would lead us and that you would guide us and that you would carry us safely through. <clears throat> and we will continue to pray the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. That night that Jesus met with his disciples the last time before his arrest, as he gathered at the table to celebrate the Passover, he took bread, and having blessed it, he broke it and said, this is my body, take and eat. And later in the meal, he took a cup, and having blessed the cup, he said, take and drink, for this is my blood, which was shed for you, the sign of the new covenant of grace. Today, as we come, and we take the symbols of the bread and the cup. May they remind us of all that he has done for us through his death and his resurrection. May they remind us that he is not yet done working and that he has many things to accomplish yet in our life and in this world. But in all things, God leads us. We are, as I mentioned, a people of the Bible. But we don't worship the Bible. The Bible is, in this form, is just a book. The pages are not sacred. The cover is not sacred. The translation is not sacred. What is sacred? The words that are contained within it. We don't bow down three times to our Bible. We don't, none of you have pictures of Bibles as earrings or necklaces, do you? What do you have? You might have a cross, but even the cross, do we worship the cross? No, we worship the one who hung on a cross and then came down off the cross. Because we are people who worship God, who has chosen to reveal himself 
through the words of Scripture. And most fully in who? His Son, Jesus Christ. We are people of the book, but we are not worshipers of the book. We worship God. And we need to remember that. But we also need to understand, next slide please, that the Bible is how God has chosen to show us who He is. It is, as Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, all Scripture is inspired, or literally in the Greek, it is God-breathed by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do what? Every good work. It is the way that God has chosen to show us who He is. And so we need to take seriously the words that are in Scripture because he said, here, let me through these various writers over thousands of years explain to you who I am. And as you come to know who I am, then that will transform your life so that you can be the people that I created you to be. Next slide, please. You see, when we're going to start in Genesis... But in order to start in Genesis, you have to understand something that we sometimes forget. What is darkness? It's the absence. See, once again, the answer is on the t- for the test is on the board. It's the absence of light. When I woke up this morning at 6 a.m. when that alarm went off, it was dark. Did I go over and turn off my darkness lamp? Did I crank down the darkness emitter? No, because darkness just exists. It is the absence of light. I got up, I turned on a light, and the darkness went away. When I got in my car and drove down the road, was I waiting for the darkness sphere to go away so that the light sphere could come up? No, I was waiting for the sun to come up because when the sun comes up, the light dispels the darkness. Darkness exists where light is not at. You don't generate or create darkness. It just is when there is no light. There's no personality. It is not measurable. I remember one time when I was uh, somewhere in high school, I and a bunch of my buddies were given permission to go to the Black Hills for a couple days at the end of haying season. So we went up and we stayed in a camper and we were doing all these Black Hills things and they have a couple caves up there. We went into the caves and one of them is called Wind Cave. If you're ever in the Black Hills, you should go to Wind Cave. And we did the old-time tour. So they treated us and talked like we were in the 1800s. And so we had a candle in a bucket. Bucket was turned sideways, a hole was punched in the bottom, and there was a candle sticking. And that was the only light we had to go down into the cave, just like they did in the 1800s, when they first opened that as a tourist place. And we got way down there. And you know, in your eyes, when there's not a lot of light, your eyes, you know, really open up and you can, and, it, and you kind of forgot how dark it was even with those little candles. So we got in this back room and he sat us all down and he told us, now, I want you to blow out your candles. And we're young and stupid, so we did. <laughs> well, we thought, well, tour guide says blow out your candles, surely he has another match. He did. So we blow out the candles, and he says to us, now, not only do you know that we have the deepest cave, the longest cave, we have the darkest cave. How do you measure darkness? Now, I can tell you in that spot, I couldn't see my hand, because there, there was no light. There was nothing. I mean, you could hit your face, and you still didn't see your hand. But you can't, you can measure a light beam, can't you? We can talk about the lumens in a bulb. We can talk about the light waves and is it a wave, is it a particle, all of that science stuff. But light is a substance. Darkness is not. It's the absence of something. So, next slide, please. It's interesting that while 
The writer of Genesis does not propose that he is writing a science book. And when we attempt to do science with it, we're, we're missing the whole intentional point of it. The point of the first part of Genesis, the first 11 chapters of Genesis, is to introduce us to this God and to introduce this God to the world. It's written at a time when they're trying to make sure that they remember that their God is not like the other gods. Because he is not saying that was created, but he is a God who creates. Very, very different. He's not made in human images, but when he gets around to making humans, whose image does he make the humans in? His. So it begins with, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Next slide, please. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Next slide. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. He said it, and it was. And God saw that the light was good. Now this is not a God who said, I wonder if light would be good. Let me try that out. Oh, wow, I kind of like that. That wasn't what God was doing. He knew what he was doing. He said, let there be light. And he revealed himself, and he saw that it was good. He was pleased because he had revealed himself, and it chased the darkness away. And then he separated the light from the darkness. Next slide, please. And he called the light day and the darkness night. The evening passed, and the morning came, marking the first day. Did God create the sun and the stars first? No, he doesn't. He waits a while for that. Why? Because the light we're talking about here is not simply something burning in the clouds. It's not the combustion of fusion and fission or whatever is going on in the sun. The light he's talking about is the revelation of himself to the world. Here I am. I've been here all along. But now I show you who I am. Next slide, please. And the light pierced the dark with the very presence of God. He was. And now he revealed himself so that others might see. And he begins then to go through the creation story. And we'll talk about that in the next few weeks as he begins to bring order and life into this world. But he has announced himself. And light then becomes this revelation of God that comes rolling down through Scripture, page after page, metaphor after metaphor, it is used to indicate God, His rightness, His righteousness, His truth, His life, holiness, salvation. Scripture is filled, filled with references of light. And yes, sometimes it's referring to the light on a candle. But a lot of times it's referring to the very presence of God. Next slide, please. In Proverbs, we have a couple of different ones. It says, the way of righteousness is like the first gleam of dawn, which shines ever brighter until the full light of day. The way of righteousness. So when you first see it, it's like that sunrise. Did you see the sunrise this morning as it painted the sky purple and blue as the sun came up? And then it became brighter and brighter. As we follow in God's righteousness, he becomes brighter in our lives. Next slide. Proverbs goes on to say, For the command... For their command is a lamp, and their instruction a light. Their corrective discipline is the way of life. Referring to the godly people. They show us the way. Their instruction is a light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Right? Next slide. Proverbs continues on. The life of the godly is full of what? Light and joy. But the light of the wicked will be snuffed out. Light does two different things here, doesn't it? Light indicates God's presence, but it also indicates one's life, doesn't it? It's full of life and God's presence, but it's also an indicator of their life. They won't have light for long if they continue down a path of wickedness. Next slide. And then Proverbs 20, 27 says it this way. The Lord's light penetrates the human spirit, exposing what? Every hidden motive. God's light shines in the darkness, not just of this world, but of our hearts, and illuminates what's going on there so that not only might we see, but that it is revealed what is actually the truth. God's light, the Lord's light, penetrates 
And the most penetrating light of the world was who? Jesus Christ. Next slide, please. Because Jesus is introduced to us in the Gospel of John as the light of the world, as Bob read earlier. The light that was there from the beginning of time. The light that darkness cannot extinguish, it cannot overcome, it cannot wipe away, it cannot smother. The true light which gives what to everyone? God's life, God's salvation, His wholeness, His holiness, His mercy, and His grace. Jesus stepped into the world And John says, I want you to understand something. When he stepped in the world, it was like day one when the light stepped in the world. The darkness had to run because God had announced his presence in a new way. On day one, God says, hello, here I am, I'm light. And on Jesus' birth, he stepped in and said, here I am again. I am the light that shines in the darkness of your heart, but I have come close to you. Paul and the other early Christians, next slide please, they understood something, that believing in Jesus, who is the light of the world, leads us to living as light in the world. You see, God didn't say, listen, I'm going to show you my light, I'm going to give you Jesus, he's really great, just watch him, he's light. He says, yes he is, he's all that, but I want you to do something. I want you to become your own individual light. Not because you are God, not because you are the Savior, not because you are the Messiah, no. But because you reflect back the light that God has shown on you through Jesus Christ. Does the moon produce any light on its own? No. What does it reflect? The sun. It's just a big mirror in the sky, for lack of any better way to say that. Kind of a dusty one, but. And yet, how many of us on a full moon night have felt that we could walk without any flashlight because the light shone so brightly off the fullness of that moon that we could see? I, when I was growing up in Nebraska, we lived in the middle of nowhere, so we had none of this light pollution that we have here on the East Coast. And uh, it was dark. I mean, when it got dark, it got dark. But that also meant we could see the stars shine. And I can remember the moons would be so bright. And especially in the winter. Because where I grew up in the winter, what covered the ground? Snow. And all that light that was reflected from the sun hit the moon. The light from the stars, it came down and reflected off that snow. And there's a lot of times you didn't have to turn on a light to find your way out to the cattle. Because there was so much reflective light, it was easy to see your way. Now imagine... If every Christian would reflect Jesus in their lives, in their thoughts, in their words, and their actions in such a way that everybody could clearly see him in their lives, not because they were Jesus, but because they simply reflected back what Jesus had already shown on them, how much brighter this world would be. We complain about the darkness and forget that we're part of the problem. We should be shining brightly. That may mean we need to go get ourselves a little cleaned up, get some of the dust off. It may mean that we need to get a little closer to the sun so that his light shines a little brighter. It may mean that we need to get ourselves turned and focused on him so that we have a clear reflection. But we are called to live as light in the world. What was the passage that Eric read? It ended with, you are to be light. God is light. His son is light. And we are to be light as well. Next slide, please. (coughs) And then there's this amazing thing. While it starts with light at the beginning of the Bible, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you the end of the story. This way, you're not worried about this. But when we get to the end of the book of Revelation and God sets all things right, He gives John this vision. It's not of us going someplace else. People forget that. They think we're going to fly off somewhere. I know, we sang I Fly Away and we love that song. Theologically, it may not be the most perfect song, but that's okay. It's a different kind of theology, and we can sing that. But it says he saw what? Heaven come down. The new Jerusalem comes down. And in this new Jerusalem, he's shown around, and everything is perfect because God has come to earth. Later he's going to say, God is among his people. But there's this passage that we forget. In verse 22 of chapter 21, it says, in the temple, in the, in, excuse me, in Jerusalem, he says, I saw no temple in the city, 
for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Jesus are its temple. They're there. We don't have to have a church building to get together because it's church all the time, everywhere. And the city has no need of sun or moon for the glory of God illuminates the city and the Lamb is its light. I don't need sun and moon, stars anymore to have daylight because the sun is the light of the world and the Son and the Father have set up their throne there in the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. Next slide, please. And it goes on to say, the nations will walk in whose light? Jesus' light. And the kings of the world will enter the city in all their glory. They came on Epiphany, they'll come on the end of the day, and its gates will never be closed at the end of the day because there is what? No night there. Why is there no night? Because there's no darkness. Why is there no darkness? Because God is there and His light shines everywhere. It began in darkness with a burst of light when God revealed Himself. And at the end of time, God will remove all the darkness. And His light will shine everywhere. And in the meantime, next slide please. Excuse me, go to the next one, please. <laughs> In the meantime, who's the light that shines around here? We are. It's not that God retired from being the light. It's not that Jesus said, listen, you know what? 33 years was enough and I'm going to retire and I'm going to go on vacation and you worry about that. No, they're still the light. And through the Holy Spirit, they're still walking among us and dwelling among us and living in us. They're still shining here. But now, He's given us a new task. You are a light of the world. One doesn't take a lamp and set it on under a basket, do you? You put it up on a lampstand. You are the light of the world. Shine so that the world might see the good things that God is doing. We are the light that is a beacon to the world. And we need to ask ourselves, first of all today, have we let God's light shine into our hearts? Have we let God's light shine on us? Or are we still trying to hide in the darkness? Because we're afraid of the light. Or we will accept His light and let it shine with His love and His grace and His mercy on us. And if we've accepted His love and His light, if He's the Lord of our lives, then are we reflecting that to the world? Are we reflecting His love and His grace and His mercy to everyone around us? Are we reflecting His truth in Scripture as revealed to us? Are we opening ourselves up so that the world might see His grace through us? And are we shining like a light in the darkness so the world can find a safe place home? Many houses have put them away now, but at Christmas one of the things that we often see in windows is what? Light a candle. It's safe to come home. The porch light is on. God's light is on. And he says, come home. Let me be the light that shines in the darkness for you. Let me show you the way. Let me show you where the rocks are. Let me show you the path to follow. And when you do that, I will lead you safely home. There's a year out in front of us and we don't know what's coming we can be all worried about the darkness that might be out there that are that which we can't see when i was a kid i was terrified of the dark i slept with lights on i hated going to the barn at night i was scared of darkness under my bed or in the closet i just didn't like dark but somehow having a light with me made me feel better you know, the darkness still is scary. The darkness of what's out there in front of us can be scary sometimes. What's around us can be scary sometimes. But what I've learned in my life is I've got two choices. I can focus on that darkness or I can focus on that light. And I can tell you one of them brings me comfort. One of them brings me deliverance. One of them brings me through everything, and that is focusing on the light. I may not know what's coming ahead. My 
ability to see for my flashlight may only go so far. But I know that God is going to be what? With me on the, every step of the way. He's going to reveal to me what I need to know when I need to know it. And he'll take me through it. If I but do what? Follow him and go to his light. As we walk into this year, may we walk towards the light of God. May we let his light bathe us and our path around us so that we might walk in the right direction. And may we reflect his light to the world so they too might walk in his light and know how to come home. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, help us this day. Help us to keep our eyes on the light and not to be scared of the dark. Help us to know that you are love and grace and mercy and that when we see your light shining, we can safely come home. We can come to you. And help us, Lord, not only just to be taker ends of the light, to be receivers of the light, but help us to be reflectors and sharers of the light into this world. Lord, one day you will shine in brightness and all the darkness will be gone. But until that day, Lord, shine brightly in our lives so that the darkness may be moved further away and that more people might be drawn into the goodness of your light and your love. Lord, be our light and our salvation this day, we ask. In the name of the one who is light, Jesus Christ. Amen.